to a lost and dying world, uh, peace and life, forgiveness of sin, and uh, imputed righteousness uh, just by faith. And Father, we just pray that as we come to Your Word tonight, may we just enjoy the life that we have in Him. May we enjoy each other as we fellowship around Your Word. And we pray, Lord, this evening as we again examine the doctrine of suffering, uh, may it certainly equip us and uh, may we understand uh, its purpose in life. And Father, we just pray for these things in Christ Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. We read there again in verse 29, uh, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. First of all, we wanted to define that word given. And uh, the root word again is uh, to grace. And what God has done, has uh, He has engraced the church, the body of Christ. He has blessed the church, the body of Christ. He is doing the church, the body of Christ, a great glorious favor by giving to us something. And the passage goes on and says that it's given in the behalf of Christ. That is, as a Christ substitute, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. We learn in this passage that as far as God's concerned, from His point of view, He gives to His children that divine heavenly treasure called suffering for a clear and distinct purpose. It's for His sake, the verse tells us. Why do Christians suffer? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to examine the reasons and the types of suffering that Paul reveals to uh, the church, the body of Christ. And, and I trust that after last night, we have learned that we need not shrink and shy away and hide in the face of trial and affliction and suffering, but we can face it head on knowing that suffering and affliction is good. It's productive. God intentionally allows His children to suffer because it's for His sake. That word suffer, again, according to Webster, it's a Latin word, uh, two words, sub ferro, which means to bear. That is to underbear, to bear under. And what God has done is uh, He's allowing us today in this dispensation of the grace of God to bear and to undergo and, and to endure those things and circumstances and situations that will come our way that cause great distress and great pain and great heartache and great discouragement. Why? Because His purpose is to to develop in our individual lives godly character. Now, we saw last night that uh, in time past, uh, suffering had a different purpose. In Deuteronomy 28, don't turn there, we saw that uh, suffering was clearly a result of, of God's hand of cursing upon the nation of Israel. And we saw that all of the suffering that the nation of Israel endured was for the purpose of destroying that group of people. All of the physical suffering Suffering and affliction and, and all of the material suffering and, and uh, the land being cursed and, and uh, diseases upon the body and loss of family and, and finances. And, and we saw the whole list there. All of it designed to destroy the children of Israel because they refused to obey the commandments of Almighty God. They refused to follow His statutes. And as a result, God cursed those people. And again, it was meant to destroy. Today, according to that verse, suffering is not designed to destroy members of the church, the body of Christ, but rather all the suffering that you and I will face and endure is productive. And why don't we uh, pick up where we left off last night. Let's turn once again to uh, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and uh, this truly is a key in our understanding of suffering. Again, last night I made mention, we, we don't really know suffering in 20th century America, okay? You and I really haven't suffered, especially when we look at the saints of God in Scripture who truly have suffered for God. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, we don't want to develop also a persecution complex. I mentioned that last night. Uh, we don't really know suffering, and, and there are many saints that go around...
Jesus or, or thinking that they're suffering for Jesus. But the Bible does teach us some things about suffering. And we're going to try to examine those things for uh, uh, throughout the weekend, actually. But the key in really understanding what it's all about is found in verse 3 of Romans chapter 5. And we read here, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh. That's the key. We want a renewed mind. We want to educate ourselves when it comes to suffering. We never want to react to the problems and turmoils in life emotionally. And that's our natural tendency, isn't it? And, and surely when there's heartache and there's pain and grief and, and there's catastrophe and calamity and problems, it's easy to react emotionally. But you and I as believers, we want to be unyielding, unmovable. We want to take a firm stand in the face of tribulation and we want to deal with it. How do we properly deal with it? Verse 3, knowing... That tribulation work. You know what we need to do? We need to think. We need to develop understanding. We want to know some things. And we're not going to view tribulation, affliction, and suffering in any other way than the way God views it. We want to renew our thinking. We want to develop a, 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 a comprehension when it comes to tribulation and affliction. We want to know what's going on. We don't want to be ignorant spiritually when it comes to suffering. We don't want to fly off the handle, blaming God, accusing God, doubting God, wondering what's going on. We want to know why it's happening. Or more importantly, why it's going to produce something in our lives. There's a purpose, a divine purpose for suffering. So the key is going to be knowledge. Let's continue now. And, and, and tonight, what I want to do is look at uh, uh, why we suffer. Last night, we talked about uh, the definition of suffering, what it's all about, our attitude towards it. But uh, we're going to look at the reason for suffering. Let's just run a, a few passages for the moment here. Go to Job, Job chapter 5. And uh, we need to understand that suffering isn't uh, uh, unique to uh, the believer. Suffering is common to all men, saved and unsaved alike. All right, No one is immune from suffering. And Job certainly does say it best in Job chapter 5. Notice verse 6 and verse 7. Job chapter 5, verse 6, Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. In other words, what the passage is saying is this, that uh, trouble and heartache and affliction, it just doesn't materialize spontaneously, okay? There's the, uh, the sowing and reaping principle that certainly runs throughout Scripture. And what we find is this, that trouble is often the byproduct, it's often the result of our own actions, okay? Job, he's suffering, certainly, and, and he's undergoing some affliction, and he realizes that it, it just didn't materialize out of thin air. There's a physical law. And, and that, this physical law says that heat rises, okay? And that's the idea there in verse 7. The sparks fly upward. Heat rises. And, and as there is a physical law in the universe that declares that heat rises, well, there is a spiritual law. And that is that man is born on to trouble, okay? It's going to come our way, folks. It's as simple as that. And if you and I, you know, and I know I do that, I think God sometimes is, is supposed to shield me <laughs> and protect me from calamity. As though the, the, the proof of God's love and care and concern for me is measured by, by how peaceful my life is, you know. And if there is...
living and un, uh, unbroken happiness and unbroken bliss in life, God must be happy with me, you know. I must be doing something right. And, and we think that as believers, falsely, we believe that God is supposed to kind of uh, uh, encapsulize us and, and protect us in some kind of a shell that will deflect and divert problems in life. And I know dear saints that honestly believe that. That, that God's going to let the problems bounce off of me. And the more spiritual you are, the less heartache and headache you have in life. Well, that would violate a spiritual law. Man is born under trouble, and God never promised us this magical, mystical, invisible shield to guard us and to protect us. Now, there's some things that we saw last night in Deuteronomy 28. God did make a promise dispensationally in time past to shield His people from calamity based on obedience to the law. But today, we have no such promise. But regardless of, of what dispensation we're in, there is this divine principle. Man is born on to trouble. Go to chapter 14 now. In Job chapter 14. And uh, uh, here we go again. Reiterated. Job chapter 14, verse 1. Man is born of a woman and is a few days and uh, full, <laughs> full of trouble. I mean, you know, it's not just a, a small degree of trouble. I'm full of it. <laughs> full of trouble. Some more than others, granted. But you know, that's man's destiny while on this planet. There's going to be trouble that will head our way. You and I as believers, the sooner we accept it, the better off we're going to be. And the sooner you and I as His children understand something about it, knowing what it is to accomplish, the better off we're going to be spiritually. And, and the passages on and on we can go. Saved, unsaved alike, man is born to trouble. Why do Christians suffer? There are three areas that we're going to look at tonight, okay? First of all, oftentimes, in fact, the majority of the time, sufferings that come our way is self-inflicted, okay? And uh, I goof up, I screw up, and I always seem to blame God for it, you know? Bad choices, bad decisions, bad thinking, and all of a sudden i got to blame God or, or beg Him to bail me out. And uh, I don't often get bailed out, all right? I'll confess that to you. Uh, but oftentimes, suffering is self-inflicted. Secondly, we're going to find out that suffering is just the natural consequence uh, of, of who we are and what we do as the children of God. And then thirdly, we're going to find out that uh, it is self-inflicted because we choose to do it for Him. And, and I'll explain that in just a moment here. But go to Second Peter. I'm sorry, First Peter chapter 2. Number 1, when we talk about suffering, we don't want to fool ourselves or trick ourselves into believing that all types of suffering that we might endure is necessarily productive, okay? Now, it seems like I'm contradicting myself. Last night, I spent so much time trying to emphasize the fact that, that suffering is good. It's a gracious gift. It's given for us in the behalf of Christ because God is trying to accomplish something. And, and now here I am, now going to show you that not all suffering is beneficial. In 1 Peter, notice chapter 2, verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience uh, toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your Falls, ye shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. In other words, Peter is saying there is no eternal value if you're suffering because of your faults. It's the sowing reaping principle. If you sow to the flesh, what's going to happen? You're going to reap to the flesh. And if you suffer as a natural consequence of, of that action and activity, don't, uh, don't gladly and patiently endure it. You're suffering because of your faults. There, there, there is no real good necessarily to come out of that in chapter 4 of First Peter. 
we read in verse 13 of chapter 4, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. For if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or of a, as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him, uh, him glorify God on, on this behalf. In other words, if I go out there and, and start making uh, wrong choices, and I start feeding the lust of my flesh, and I begin to suffer, the passage, the spiritual principle is, hey, that's not the type of suffering we're talking about, all right? And all too often when people are suffering, it's their own fault. No real glory entailed in that type of suffering. That's that sowing and reaping principle. That's not the type of suffering we're talking about. We're talking about different types of suffering. Go back to Philippians chapter 1 now, and, and let's examine the, the right type of suffering. And, and we're going to see that if we're suffering rightfully as a result of doing what uh, we should be doing, there is divine purpose. There is going to be something spiritually accomplished in our lives. And it begins right here, again, in Philippians chapter 1. And we notice there in verse 28, "...and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God." You know what we read in this passage? We see that there are some adversaries, okay? And what Paul begins to do, he's trying to encourage the Philippian saints here. Dear saints, uh, dear church, a model church, a model assembly. And Paul is well aware that there is some, uh, some problems and conflicts that, that are evident in this assembly. And so he encourages them, and he says there in verse 28, Don't be terrified by your adversaries. There's going to be enemies out there, enemies opposed to what God is doing, enemies opposed to what God is preaching to the world today, enemies that are opposed to the ministries that you and I are engaged in, okay? And when the adversities begin to come our way, it is not evidence that we're doing something wrong. That's what Paul's telling these folks. When, when numbers are low, when finances drop, when no one attends, when no one believes, when people scorn, mock, and reproach, and reject us, and reject the message, we sometimes think that maybe we're not in the will of God. We must not be doing something right. Apparent failure in ministry is never an indication that we're out of the will of God. Contrary, Paul is saying, you're doing it right. How do I know? You got problems. Praise God. Isn't it? Why does Paul say, I rejoice in my sufferings? I glory in my infirmities because I'm doing something right. The measure... The standard of success in ministry isn't based upon gain and, and numbers and, 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 you know, programs and order. That's not, Paul is saying to these saints, look, because you have adversaries, it is an evident token of perdition, but to you, of salvation, this is a clear sign and, and testimony, you're the children of God. You know what these religionists on the television are trying to, to spew? <laughs> and I, they're really spewing some of this out. That a child of God today should not experience suffering. This passage is telling me that it is an evident, a clear sign and testimony. You're the saved children of Almighty God. Don't be ashamed if you have adversaries. Understand you're special to God. Look it over there in First Thessalonians. And, and look what he says. And by the way, this is the second assembly here that is, uh, that is, okay?
okay? Uh, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians. I had to get my numbers right here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, notice what we read here. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. No, I think I was right the first time. Where am I? Man, oh man. I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye... Oh, we're going to study that one tomorrow morning. Endure. Endure. That's the fruit of suffering. The ability to endure it. Which, verse 5, is a manifest... There's that word token again. Here, these saints, they're, they're being persecuted. They experience tribulations. They're tolerating it. They're enduring it. They're undergoing the distress and pain and discouragement. They're hanging in there. They're bearing it. And instead of busting at the seams and falling apart and wondering why God isn't blessing us with peace and prosperity and success, Paul says, verse 5, a manifest token, a clear sign of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. This is a clear manifest token that you are worthy of the kingdom of God. You're the children of God. Don't ever confuse suffering with, with failure. Paul, in two passages, we just read them, he says that suffering indicates you're the children of God. Now, why? Why should we anticipate and expect suffering? And why would suffering in this day and age be an indication that we're the children of God? You know what? <laughs> How often do we fail to recognize and understand and, and remind ourselves we're not of this world? Amen. That's the problem. We, the body of Christ, are unwelcomed guests. Who is the God of this world? Who runs the show in this world? Who pushes the buttons, pulls the strings? Who manipulates? Who has a course, a strategic course operating in the world today? The prince and the power of the air, the great adversary of God, the devil, the usurper, that serpent, the devil. Okay, This isn't God's territory right now. We are the uninvited guests that are here temporarily to let the world know something about God Almighty and His offer of grace. So it should never come to a surprise. It, it ought never be a surprise when, when adversaries and heartache and turmoil and rejection and affliction and persecution hit us like a ton of bricks. We don't belong here, folks. <laughs> We don't belong here. Let's run. Let's let's emphasize that. Second John, um, notice in in uh, uh, First John. Man, I'm, my my numbers are off, but that's okay. First John, make that uh, First John, and notice uh, here in uh, chapter five. First John, chapter five, verse uh, nineteen. First John, chapter five, verse nineteen. And we know that we are of God. Now, we understand the immediate context here in 1 John. It has to do with the New Covenant. It has to do with the nation of Israel. But notice what we read in verse 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. The whole world and its systems and its fashions are laying on the lap of wickedness. You and I are foreigners. You and I are aliens. You and I, you know what happens when when uh, uh, 
When a foreign object might enter our bodies or our bloodstreams, when something that doesn't belong in our systems enter our tissue or our bloodstream, you know it, immediately our immune system kicks in the gear, doesn't it? T cells, A cells, and all these other cells uh, begin to, to, to attack the invading bacteria. We are the invading bacteria of the world system. The world hates us, folks. I said one time, and I got in trouble for it, but, but we're a boil on the bottom of this world. I was accused of saying something else. We are the boil on the bottom of this world. And the world systems now are going to engage and attack the invading forces. We as the children of God have no claim to this planet. We have no business being here. Go to John chapter 15. And, and this, hey, this isn't new doctrine. Notice what we read in John chapter 15. Our problem is we get so intimately attached to the world, don't we? I do. I, I'll be, I, through confessions. My roots, you know, I, I sink them into the world. And, and the world's tentacles begin to choke me. And I get wrapped up in, in the affairs of this life. And when somebody makes fun of me because I represent Jesus Christ, I get hurt. <laughs> it, why should I be shocked or surprised? I don't belong here. And I ought to quit setting my roots here because my home is there in heavenly glory. In John chapter 15, notice what we read as the Lord Jesus Christ is ministering to His disciples. John chapter 15, notice verse um, uh, 18. If the world hates you... Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Get in line. <laughs> Christ says, I'm ahead of you here. If ye were of the world, verse 19, the world would love his own. Oh, if we were part of this world. You know, I don't like confrontation. I'm more of a reconciling type of a guy. You know, I hate fight. I hate conflict. You know, I, 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 I'm squeamish when it comes to that. You know, and hey, you know, let's get along. You know, I mean, but let's not compromise the doctrine, okay? And, you know, I know something's not right when uh, life is kind of smooth and easy and I'm having a great time with my unsaved peers, okay? And uh, when all of a sudden they feel like they want to pal around with me, I, I sit back and I think, why do they want to pal around with me? Why is it that, you know, why, why is life so great? Why are they willing to embrace me sometimes as, I'm, as though I'm one of them, you know? If I understand these passages and I am, am demonstrating and testifying the life that I have in Jesus Christ, this passage, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. You're a welcome guest. You're one of us. <laughs> but because... Ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Now, if I'm a member of the church, the body of Christ, hey, the world's not going to become my friend. The world isn't going to become friendly to what I have to say. The world will not be friendly to the one I represent, the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the ire and hatred and vehement hatred that is, is concentrated on Jesus Christ. And we know it because of the cross. The world hates the Son. Hates all that God has to offer. Spurns His love. And if I represent Him accurately, the world now turns against me. And, and you know, the world can't, can't put their hands on Lord Jesus Christ anymore, can they? No more crown of thorns, right? No more nails through His hands. They can't touch Him anymore. But we're around. If they can't get Him, you know who they're going to come after? Us. And the world is going to hate His children. The world is going to hate His own. The world isn't going to be very pleased to have us around. We're the fly in the ointment. We're the, the invading bacteria. And what Paul is trying to say is this. Brothers out there in Philippi, brothers out there in, Thessal in Thessalonica, you know what? All the affliction and sufferings that you are patiently enduring...
an evident manifest token that, man, you're the children of God. Count it. Count it. A, a privilege. It's proof you're His. It's proof you're His. And we ought not shy away. We're just pilgrims in this world. Go back to Philippians 1. And, and there's something here that we need to notice real quickly. We're spending a lot of time in Philippians 1 because that's our text. And, and I really, it's just such a, a joy to be able to, to dissect and extract the truth when we rightly divide. And, and, and of course, we, we do it honestly and sincerely. Verse 28 tells us, uh, Philippians chapter 1, Verse 28, here we are, we're the emissaries of God, right? We're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We're representing the kingdom of God, the, 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 the king, okay? And, and we're ambassadors with a message. And we're here reflecting the light, ref- communicating the message. And, and we're just transients, we're just pilgrims, okay? We're not of this world. We have, we have no claim, we have no hope, we have no promise in this system, and while we're here, and, and we're going to, to be the recipients of the world's hatred, Paul tells these saints in verse 28 of chapter 1, in nothing, in no thing, terrified by your adversaries. You know what we need to learn about ad- adversity? And this has to do with suffering. And by the way, we haven't even begun to look at why we suffer yet. You know what we need to do? When adversity heads towards us, like a speeding locomotive at times, and the calamity comes our way, and the reproach and rejection and scorn of men come at us, we have a tendency to bolt and hightail it. Paul says, in nothing terrified. Don't react emotionally to the situation, okay? Don't Panic! <laughs> Don't panic! What does he say to the Thessalonians? And, and, and this is a great passage to compare it with. Now we go to 2 Thessalonians. And notice we re- read there in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, this is what Paul is going to uh, encourage these uh, saints there in Macedonia. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and said, Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that, that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And ye know it. Philippians, don't be terrified. Don't panic. Don't run. Thessalonians, be not moved, verse 3 tells us. Hold your ground. Maintain. Don't wobble or waver. When the problems come, we want to be like Adam and hide in the bushes. And God said, where you at, Adam? Where you at? Paul saying, stand your ground. Face it. You ever face something that's scary? Ah. Uh, you know, I I I, I only I can I can't ever forget when I was a child delivering newspapers. I was real small delivering newspapers, and uh, if you're a paper boy, you might uh, uh, appreciate and, and, and maybe uh, you can sympathize with me. But I was scared to death of dogs, and as a paper boy, you always seem to run into dogs. You know, you go into the yard, whatever, and and and, and there was one German Shepherd that uh, always had a muzzle, uh, one of those muzzles on, you know. And uh, I, I hated this place, and, and I always tried throwing the paper over the fence, you know, and if I miss tough, I'm not going to go into this yard. And, and, uh, and so one day as a kid, you know, I'm not paying much attention, the gate is open, and I thought, oh, I don't know. And the shepherd walked over to the gate, and his muzzle was off. He saw me, and he bolted right at me. And I'm just a little kid, and, and, and luckily I didn't run. I was shocked, I was scared, I was petrified, and I stood there. And he, the dog stopped short, you know, a couple of feet, and showing the teeth. And I'll never forget my knees. I literally, my knees were like this. And I'm just waiting. And then the owner, you know, oh, he won't hurt you or something dumb like that. And, and, and you know, the dog was obedient, luckily, and the dog ran back to its owner. But, but for, for the next few minutes, I, I, I just I came unglued. I, I, I just didn't know what to do. I thought I was going to die. 
I was going to die. That was it. That was it. That's the idea. Paul is saying, don't be terrified. Don't, don't panic and run and, and just go flying half cocked and, and, and fly off the handle and get all unglued and break at the seams. He says, don't move. Maintain your ground. Maintain your stance and place and position in, in Jesus Christ. And all too often we begin to run and hide and and we try to, to, to get away from the adversity. Paul says, hang in there. He says in verse 3, for yourselves what? There's that word again. No, you know you have understanding. You know that we are appointed thereunto. We have an appointment. Our earthly destiny entails suffering. Paul says, is that a surprise? Is that, you know, is that uh, something that, that, oh, I'm dismayed? I, I, Paul says, obvious. It's obvious. It's our appointment. You know it. We need to know that it's going to occur. And don't go (laughs) flying off thinking that it's unfair, God. Oh, if you really loved me and if you really cared about me and if you really, really are interested in my life and cares and concerns, you know, you would do this and manipulate and change and all of that. You know, God says, no, you know that's our earthly destiny. It should come to no surprise. Tell you what, let's look at the reasons why we suffer, okay? And, and these are reasons that, that uh, all of us can, can really relate to, okay? Let's begin. Romans chapter 8, okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 18. And, and there, there are many passages. We'll just go uh, through as many as uh, we can tonight anyway. But uh, the first reason why Christians suffer is really obvious. We're the children of God. Don't expect any less. Don't ever expect special treatment from the world because we represent Him. Contraire, just the opposite, expect the worst, okay? And if you do get the worst, don't think God's against you. It just testifies you're the children of God, all right? So let's not panic. Let's not run. Let's not be moved. Success, health, wealth, prosperity is never, never an indication you're in the will of God and serving Him properly. In fact, Paul is going to teach, usually it's just the opposite, okay? It's just the opposite, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. Romans chapter 8, here's one that we all can relate to. This isn't a a difficult one, but in Romans chapter 8, we see there in verse 18, um, For I reckon that the sufferings uh, sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know and understand that the world is under a curse. God, we, we don't see immense blessing. What we see in creation is a, is a result and consequence of sin back there in Genesis. God cursed the ground. We don't see the, the, the blossoming, flowering uh, uh, glory that the earth is, is uh, uh, going to uh, reveal in the future. But the creation and the creature is under bondage, under the bondage of corruption. Verse 22, for we, there's that word again, know that the whole cre- creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You know, there is travail and agony. That the creation experiences as a result of sin. But we're so used to it. We're so conditioned and desensitized, we don't really experience it, do we? Hey, this is normal. It isn't normal. There is a 
years that that uh, 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 in in uh, uh, just kind of adorns and, and engulfs all of creation. World affair. This is a normal condition. This is not God's original intent. We can We don't know any different. We're born into this situation. It seems normal, but the verse, the whole creation. It's you know what the word groan means. Quietly aches. You ever have a quiet ache? There's a quiet aching. And travaileth in pain together to not. And not only they, but who else? Ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. You know, I sometimes, I sometimes sit back and say, what's the use? You know, and, and, you know, I'm subject to the corrupt creation. And, and, and the corrupt creation, hey, it brings some some quiet. It brings some groaning, and heartache, and despair, and discouragement. The verse tells us, you know what? Hey, we're groaning. We're gro- We hurt. We hurt. All of us can experience some of that. Not only the creation, but look specifically. Uh, if we go to Second Corinthians chapter four, in Second Corinthians chapter four, we can we can break it down just one step further. You know, God. God is a gracious God. And you know, you ever wonder why the moment we don't get saved, we're in heavenly glory? We're not, are we? We get saved and things are still the same. You know, things don't change. You know, I don't feel that much better sometimes. I mean, I'm more content spiritually. Hey, I got, I've got, when we know we have peace, it, it affects us, no doubt. But physically, our circumstances don't change. God knows that, okay? And, and you know what we're going to find tomorrow morning if you come back? I hope you do. God, He's going to pay us back. He, he, he's, going to, he's promising us something because He's allowing us to continue on in the sin-cursed creation and in these corruptible bodies. God, he's going, to, he's going to give us something in return for it, okay? He hasn't forgotten. He knows what's going on. And what He's going to do is He's, he's, going, to, he's going to pay us back for it. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And then we go down in, in verse 1 of chapter 5, For we know, there's that word know again, that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. You know what we learn? That, that these bodies of corruption is cause for groaning. These bodies, and, and uh, tomorrow morning we're going to examine chapter 4 a little bit more, but the whole context there, Paul in verse 11 of chapter 4, he describes what he, he endures physically. The physical beatings and, and bearing about in his body, his physical body, the marks of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, yeah, we know something. The outward man, it's rotting. It's corruptible. It's, it's disintegrating before our very eyes. Do you know of anyone who is getting younger and healthier? <laughs> Absolutely not. Talking to the dear lady there. Oh, I, I have a, a dear saint back home who's suffering Parkinson's disease. And, and, and I've seen him over the years progressively getting worse, you know. And, and, and they can't stop it. And, 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 and now he can't even hold a fort. And he has no control. And his knees are given out. He's losing his mind. He can't see anymore. He has a walker. His wife is just as old and just as, as physically infirm. She can't take care of him. The body is rotting and disintegrating before our very eyes. And you know what it does to us, the children of God? It causes us to groan. It hurts physically. It hurts. We don't enjoy all of that. We know it's happening and we groan because of it and God knows that. He's aware of it. He knows what's happening. He's touched by our affliction. And we'll see some of those passages that demonstrate that. But you know what? We suffer not only because we are the children of God...
Because we're, we are the prisoners of a corrupt body and a corrupt creation. It's around us. God hasn't changed that. He's left us here to do something in the midst of all of that. But, but these bodies are cause for some suffering, physical and suffering. And, and look what Paul says about that. If you notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look what he says there in verse 10. And, and here's the attitude. Remember what we said when we began the, uh, uh, the conference that, that it is given. This is a glorious divine gift of God. He graciously bestows upon us suffering. And Paul, with that renewed mind, he concludes in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 12, Therefore I take pleasure in what? Infirmities, physically weak and sick. But that, the physical sufferings that we endure when our health fails us, Hey, that's part of suffering. And you and I will experience it, some worse than others. But, but that's part of the sufferings that we all experience. Another reason why Christians suffer, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, another cause for suffering. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse uh, uh, 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, we read here, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Any of you experience the loss of loved ones? Doesn't it bring some heartache and grief and ache and pain? Doesn't it emotionally, you know, it hurts? It hurts. Be it a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, a wife, a husband. Hey. It's okay to cry, okay? It, it hurts. It hurts. Why do Christians sometimes suffer? Because, hey, you know what? There are individuals that we're, we're, we're close to and, and close with. And you know what? There's going to be some sorrow out there where, when, when they leave us, when, they, when they're gone. That's why verse 18 tells us, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We experience sorrow, the heartache, the pain and the agony when we lose those whom we love. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Another cause of suffering in the life of the believer. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. This one, this one we, we, many, many have experienced this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. I know both, I know both. Here we, here's that word again. No, <laughs> I keep saying that. Notice that word. No, 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 no. Don't be ignorant spiritually. When it comes to suffering, equip yourselves with knowledge. And you know what? We'll be able to stand, not be moved. We won't be terrified when, when the sufferings and afflictions come our way. Verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul, the apostle, he experienced great physical need and great financial need. You and I might be experiencing physical and financial uh, problems. There are many saints of God who are financially destitute. I know some. And, and, and hey, just trying to survive day in and day out is not easy. Paul says, you know, I know what it means not to know where my next meal is coming from. And I know what it means to be hungry and to be destitute and to have uh, material lack. Paul says, you know, I've learned how to handle those things. And, and, and I know what it means to suffer need. He's undergoing and, and he's enduring need. That's, what, that's another reason why believers sometimes suffer. But, you know, there's another area of suffering that we can voluntarily choose to enter into. Now, the first type of suffering, again, self-inflicted because of uh, a bad living, a bad choices, unwise decisions in life. There is suffering that occurs just because of the natural state and, and, and natural affairs of life, be it creation, these physical bodies, uh, uh, be it the loss of loved ones or, or having physical want and physical need, you know. Uh, but you know what? There's a third category of suffering that God invites you to partake in. 
You don't have to suffer if you don't want to for Him. That's okay. God isn't going to hold it against you. But uh, you might lose something as a result of that. But there is this third category of suffering that you and I can voluntarily enter into. And let's examine this type of suffering, which is just glorious. In Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, notice verse 2. Get Galatians chapter 6 and then uh, Romans chapter 15. Galatians 6 and then Romans 15. We're getting close here. We're winding it down. (laughs) But I I just want to examine some of the reasons why Paul suffered and some of the reasons that that other believers uh, oftentimes suffer and undergo pain. And distress. In Galatians chapter 6, notice what we read here in verse uh, 1 and verse 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You don't have to do this. But you and I are called to bear one another's burdens. You know what? I might suffer for you because I choose to do that. If I see a brother or sister who is experiencing something, a difficulty in life, some kind of a dilemma, I can step in and carry that weight and load with him or her. And that is the mind of Christ operating. It's your choice. God's not going to browbeat you or or scare you or intimidate you into doing this. Grace can lead you to do what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. And that is forget about self and sacrifice self and start caring for the needs of others. We have a glorious privilege You notice the word bear, that's that word, endure again, to to just tolerate it. Bear ye one another's burdens. Share in the sufferings of others. Now, some of us, I still don't have it quite right yet in my life, when sufferings come my way, how to handle it. But when we reach a point of spiritual maturity, we ought to be equipped so that not only can I handle my own sufferings, I'm going to help you with your sufferings. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse, uh, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. In other words, you know what you need to do? Hey, if, if there are those that are, that are weak or, or they lack, re- receive them. Receive them. Take them on board. Oh, what did I say? Oh, that's 14.1. But I want 15.1, okay? But, but 14.1, I'm sorry. So we're at 4.21. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. If, if there are... In, now, when it comes to, to heartaches, okay? I've got... You know, we all experience some problems in life. But you know, when it comes to, to spiritual babes in Christ... It's going to take some blood, sweat, and tears sometimes, right? It's going to take time. Paul tells the Corinthians, you know, I'm willing to spend and be spent for you. Paul, who had the care of all the churches, okay? And Paul, he was was involved in ministry and, and he had cares and concerns and problems. But you know what? He always spent time with those that were young in the faith. and Receive them. Take them in. Care for them. Teach participate in their ministries. There are going to be those that are weak in the faith. Babes in Christ. That's how we read. About, that's what we read there in, in the book of Corinthians there. They're, they're going to be babes in Christ. And you and I have a glorious privilege and opportunity. Hey, take them on in. Notice now chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are strong, you see, We have those that are weak. They're still infantile spiritually. And it's easy to neglect them. But we, them that are strong, spiritual mature, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Here you go again. Lift the load up for them. Carry it. Help them out. Bear it. But it's their infirmity. You know, others are going to have problems and heartaches and miseries. We want to develop that spiritual attitude and mindset that says, hey, I don't want you to go it alone, man. I want to help you with it. I want to carry it. I want to bear it with you. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. 
Know the reason why, why saints of God, children of God, might suffer. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, uh, 9. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. 2 Timothy 2, verse 9, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure. Remember what we said with the fruit of the Spirit? One of the fruits of the Spirit is long-suffering. To suffer long. The ability to suffer for a length of time. The idea of enduring and bearing up. I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You know why sometimes saints suffer? Because they volunteer to, to, to do the work of the ministry. This is self-inflicted, yes. But it's uh, voluntary. You don't have to suffer if you don't want to in this regard. But Paul, his choice is, hey, I am willing to endure all things for the elect's sake. You see, if it means the advancement of the gospel, if it means the edification of the saints of God, if it means the Word of God being spread abroad, you know what Paul says? I'm willing to endure anything. Anything. I love them. I love them. I love the message. I love the ministry. I love my Savior. I love the Word of God. And I'm willing to put up with it. I'm willing to do that. The work of the ministry can be cause of great suffering. Look at First Timothy chapter one, uh, four. First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four, verse ten. First Timothy chapter four, verse ten. For therefore we both labor and suffer. Repro laboring and suffering go hand in hand. To labor in ministry is to toil and <laughs> to the point. Of exhaustion. You know what our problem sometimes is in the work of the ministry? We give God second best. We give Him the residue, you know, of what's left over. Whatever's left over of my time, whatever's left over with my of my money, whatever is left over of my resources. Paul says, you know what, Timothy, if you're going to engage in the work of the ministry, we need to labor and suffer. You know, we read about those uh, uh, fellow soldiers of Christ, those fellow laborers of Paul, I'm sorry. We read there in Corinthians that they were addicted to the ministry. They needed their fix in ministering to the saints. They couldn't get enough. The saints were priority. The ministry was priority. They came first and foremost. Not when, if I have time, Wednesday evening. Not when maybe I've got a few hours to spare on Saturday morning. And uh, after we pay our bills, maybe then, you know, we can give a little more to the offering plate. You don't see that operating in Scripture at all. It's got the Philippians we read last night. Those churches in Macedonia, they give beyond their ability. You see, they didn't give uh, based upon what they were able to give. They gave beyond their ability. They gave according to the needs of the saints, not according to what they were able to give. Remember we saw that passage last night? That's the, that's the work of the ministry. It's, it's having that zeal, being driven, having an addiction, the need to minister, hungering to minister and labor and toil and work and labor and suffering go hand in hand. Timothy, and we don't have time, but in other passages in First and Second Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, hang in there and, and give it your life. Give it your life. But you know what that's going to entail? It's going to entail some suffering. And it's going to cost us something. We're going to have to pay a price if we want to do that work of ministry. It's laboring. It's laboring. It's working in agony and in pain to accomplish the task of the work of of the ministry. Oh, let's go just a few more passages and we'll wind up Philippians chapter 2. Here, here is a classic example of such a, 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 a mind that is willing to give oneself wholly to the work of the ministry. Philippians chapter 2. Here is a classic example of an individual who, who decided that the care of the saints was more important than life itself. And you know who he is, don't you? 
Epaphrodites, Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphrodites, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed, he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And I send him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. Who are the role models of, of God today? Who are the ones we are to highly esteem? And, and who are the ones we should follow and pattern our lives after? Men like Epaphrodites who quietly gave and sacrificed to the point, verse 30, because for the work of Christ He was nigh unto death, not regarding His life. Now this is an individual who, who went, who, who served to the point of, of, of death. Now, now, no guilt trips, okay? <laughs> don't feel as though, well, man, you know, I don't know if I can do that. You know, I, I've never served in, in such capacity. And by the way, you know, the Philippians didn't know it. You know what I learned about suffering? We don't advertise it, okay? We don't, lay, we don't wave banners and flags saying, I'm, I'm persecuted for Jesus. I'm suffering for Him. No one knew that Epaphrodites was on his death, near death, working, laboring, toiling, serving. Paul, had remi Paul told them and then Philippians reacted and they, they did something to correct the situation. That, that's a that tells me something. I'm not going to advertise <laughs> if i got problems. I don't need to. But you know what the verse says there in verse 29? Hold such in reputation. Those are the guys we want to follow. These are the ones addicted to the ministry. We want to follow those. Guys. Hey, man, <laughs> they make a name for themselves. Hold them, hold such in reputation. This is the example of sacrifice in the work of the ministry. But it's, there's a price that was paid, wasn't it? And you know what we're going to learn tomorrow morning? I, I promise we'll get to it tomorrow morning. The more you suffer, the more you endure the agony and the pain and, and, and the distresses of ministry and of life, the greater reward you're going to... You know why Epaphroditus was willing to die? You know why Paul said, okay, I'm in a straight betwixt two, you know, and take my head off, it's okay, because I'd rather be with Christ, which is far greater. Because they knew that the more they suffered and were afflicted and, and, and experienced pain, the greater reward they'll receive in eternal glory. Epaphroditus was at a point in his ministry in life where he said, you know what? My body does, it doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing. Now, I don't want you to walk away thinking that you ought to, uh, you know, experience the same. Don't neglect your physical. I'm not saying, you know, you become suicidal or neglect your physical needs, okay? Uh, um, but I'm saying that maybe we need to get our priorities straight. Priorities right. The saints should always come first few more reasons why uh, saints suffer, but uh, uh, let's just go to, to one more that, that I think all of us, uh, to some degree, have experienced suffering, and if we go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll close here, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, there we go, don't be terrified, don't be moved, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You know what? When we simply believe the Word of God, when we preach the Word of God, when we share the message of God's grace, the Word of God rightly divided to others, you know what that will oftentimes entail? It'll entail suffering. Timothy was on the verge of quitting the ministry, I believe. And Paul says, Timothy, hang in there, stir up that gift, get, get, get on fire again. And he says, don't be ashamed, but rather partake. 
join in in the suffering and in the affliction of the gospel. You and I, as ministers of reconciliation, we have a message to preach and teach, don't we? And if we are, you know, emissaries of God, ambassadors of, 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 our, of our God, and, and we're here on enemy territory, unwelcomed, and the moment we begin to teach and to preach that wonderful news that God has for all humanity, you better believe there's going to be opposition. There's going to be resistance. And it's easy for us when the opposition and the resistance is there and the adversity comes our way, it's easy to step back. Paul says, partake. Join in. It's the result of the Gospel of our God. It's according to the Gospel. Just because we believe what we believe will suffer. I know men who have law whose families won't even communicate with them anymore because they've taken a stand for the Word of God rightly divided. They understand the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and they've lost family as a result of that. And they're suffering. They're, that's a form of suffering. Affliction. Paul says, you know, that's a price that oftentimes is paid, but it's a price that's worth paying. And that's certainly the case. Tomorrow morning, we're going to look at how we deal. How do we handle the suffering, alright? We, we understand something about suffering, why we're suffering, but okay, now, now let's put some flesh and blood on this. And, and when I am now at a point in my life where, hey, it's knocking on my door. I, I see it. I feel it. I'm experiencing it. How do I react? How do I deal with it? How do I handle it? It's easy to say, don't be terrified. It's easy to say, don't be moved. But, but is there more to it than that? And, and yes, there is something more to it than that. There is a recipe, but it's not a recipe. Uh, it's no secret. There is a way to handle that suffering so that you come out a victor in each and every case. You can stand. And there's a key and a secret to that. If you're suffering, if you're experiencing turmoil, and you're experiencing heartache in life, uh, don't blame God. Don't blame God. It is not uh, a manifestation uh, of God's love. It's not a manifestation of God's anger. It's not a manifestation of anything. It's going to happen. It's part of humanity. It's part of the human race. It's part of the sin-cursed creation. And uh, there's a worse type of, a worse form of suffering that awaits humanity out there. It's called the lake of fire. It's called the second death. It's called hell, and it's described as, as possessing fire and brimstone that, that, that burns, and it burns forever, and it's intense, and it's eternal, and there's a form of suffering, of, of, of eternal spiritual pain and agony. Romans tells us that, that it entails great anguish. We learn in the book of Romans that there is going to be indignation and wrath. It's God's attitude of hatred, of, of anger and indignation that is going to be poured out against individuals who refuse His offer of salvation, who refuse his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and as that indignation and holy hatred is expressed, that soul will feel and experience for all eternity tribulation and anguish, the Word tells us. Well, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be intense agony and pain forever for individuals who say no to God's free gift. And that's a shame. That need not be. God offers as a free gift eternal life. He offers as a free gift imputed righteousness. He says, take it. The price has already been paid when Jesus Christ shed His blood for sinners. We don't have to try to get to God. Christ Jesus already came offering His life so that you might have eternal life. But for those who choose not to receive that gift of eternal life, all that awaits them is eternal suffering in that lake of fire. And you know what? Those individuals are there by choice. They're there. Can you believe that? Tonight you have the choice to make. You can either say yes to God's gift of eternal life you can, by faith, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can 
trust. You can rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. By grace are you saved through grace, and that not of yourselves. It is the, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't do it as, as hard and, and, as, and as, uh, 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 as much effort as you might put into it. You can't please and appease God. God has done it for us. You have the choice right now to just take that gift. It's free and it's eternally yours. Or you can choose to reject it but you've made the choice of eternal damnation and separation and alienation from Almighty God. You've chosen to suffer for eternity. You can't blame God for that decision because you're hearing the message right now. If I were you, I'd take heavenly glory. It's free. It's free. Why not, why not take it now? Receive them, accept them, and avoid the suffering eternally. Heavenly Father, again, we do thank You for Your love and for Your grace. And Father... We just pray at this time that, that uh, we again would, would take heart and uh, Your Word and, and that we would allow it to work and effectually impact our hearts and minds. And may we have understanding and knowledge when it comes to uh, suffering and difficulty. And Father, we just pray for those hearts that uh, might not have uh, the assurance of salvation. We pray, Lord, that they would make that decision this evening to trust in the finished work of Christ, not relying upon their own energies and, and their own efforts and their own good works. But Father... Uh, just uh, uh, receiving the free gift of eternal life. We thank you, Father, for all that you've given to us and, and uh, 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 for us through Christ Jesus. And uh, Father, we just give you all this thanks in Christ Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.